of the valley, bright and morning star, fairest of ten thousand, refiner of my heart. He's a holy rose of Sharon, the soon and coming king. And when I think about him, it makes me want to sing. the other day knelt down beside me and we began to pray we started talking about revival we talked about God's grace I looked upon his goodness I had to hide my face Good evening, everybody. Sorry for the delay. We had a we had to help our UStream and our um, Glory Bound webcast people to come on. So, David, if you can turn the other David off, and we'll take care of the music from here on. Hallelujah. of this song, I'm going to tell you something that I know. It reminds me of what T.L. Osborne used to say. He said, I may not know much, but what I do know is very important. I believe, I 
is impossible. Is impossible. Oh, say that again. With God, With God nothing, nothing is impossible. Is impossible. Amen? Amen? Oh, that's what I say. No limitations in the spirit there are no limitations in the glory realm no limitations in the spirit there are no limitations in the glory realm who the sun sets free is free indeed well i'm free i'm free free indeed who the sun sets free is free indeed well i'm free i'm free free indeed everybody said no in the spirit there are no limitations in the glory realm no limitations in the spirit there are no limitations in the glory realm i can be who you want me to be i can do what you want me to do and i can go where you want me to go i can flow come close no thing can compare you're our living home your presence Lord I've tasted and seen of the 
sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone in your presence Lord in your presence Lord oh in your presence my worth more there's nothing worth more that will ever come close no thing can compare you're our living home in your presence Lord I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone in your presence lord in your presence lord yeah in your holy presence lord Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence. Lord, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the Take a step into the heavenlies. Let us become more aware of your presence, Lord. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Your glory, God, is 
what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence Lord Step away from his presence. Your presence, Lord. such a blessing to Todd. You know, sometimes we have speakers come that just come to just bless our socks off. And sometimes we are in the position to help bless their socks off. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll tell you, he left barefoot. Okay, so we did a nice <laughs> job. We're going to receive our offering tonight uh, for your tithes and offerings. If you need an envelope, we have our usher who will bring it to you. Just raise your hands for that. It's for your credit card giving. If you're watching by the internet, push donate. And let's just keep doing a good job. What Paul says, is it too much to ask for material goods when we've done the spiritual goods? And I'm telling you, it's interesting about giving. Because when you're giving, what you're really doing is sowing some things for yourself. It really is. It works out so wonderfully. And I think the freedom that I think all of us should always walk in is freedom financially. Remember, you are not on this earth to pay bills. You'll have them. But that's not your existence. That's not why you're here. That's right. You're here as a worshiper of God, and you seek first the kingdom of God. I seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and his way of doing things, and everything else is going to line up. Amen? Amen. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that your word is what is truth, because it's you, Father. And you have spoken to us that your kingdom come, your will be done on earth, just like it is in heaven, and there's no lack in heaven. And I thank you that you've given us a way to sow. You've given us seed to the sower, yes. and we're the sower, Father, and we thank you for that seed producing in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Whenever you're ready, keep worshiping. Bring it up as a worship. Keep worshiping. here I received an offering I said I'm gonna ask for everything that you didn't give in Todd's offering you remember I asked for everything else I'm gonna ask 
for that same offering again, not for me, but for the Lord. Just as a reminder that he wants everything. He wants everything. Everything. The good, the bad, the ugly, the positive, the negative. He wants it all, amen. He wants you. Everything. And the Bible says that it is our reasonable service to give it to him. So be reasonable tonight. And give it up all over again. Well, I did that in 1952. Good. I'm glad. Do it again. Well, I did that last week when you asked me to. Well, good. Do it again. Just say, here I am, down on my knees again, surrendering all, surrendering all. Desperate for you, I surrender.
it all. Amen. He deserves it all. Amen. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Isn't it wonderful to worship God? It is a wonderful thing to worship him. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, you deserve everything that we are. And Father, most importantly tonight, we want to connect with you. We want to see exactly the way you see things. And Father, I'm asking you by your Holy Spirit, to be amongst us in such a way that it is a tangible thing, that there is no doubt in our mind that you are here in our midst. And we thank you in the holy name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. You know, tonight, 
I'm going to be talking about what to remember. The Bible tells us that which is good and lovely and a good report, we're to think on these things. And when we start understanding how powerful our thought life is, how important it is to meditate and ponder on the things of God, we would be very much a type of people that would say, I'm not going to think about that. There's no way I'm going to rehearse that in my mind. There's no way I'm going to do this. And so we're going to start off by running this video. Go ahead. Yeah, you know that feeling, right? That feeling you get when you're hearing the word or you're seeing the dream and you start to seem a little bit crazy, a little hazy because the blood is rushing to your brain. You feel a little insane to believe that this word that you're hearing could possibly be true, but you do because it came from the God who created you. I guess what I'm trying to say is your energy level goes from zero to a hundred real quick. But then the moment passes, a day goes by, a week, a month, a year, you're still in the same place, still doing the same thing, wanting to scream, why, 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 why doesn't it seem like I thought it would seem? What do you do when it's not coming true? What do you do when it feels like your God is failing you? I've been there, but then I recall when God called his people to look back and remember what he did for them way back then and how he will do it again how we freed them. So could it be that possibly remembering has the ability to bring back a lost faith that was once in me? I think so. So I will go back to the beginning, back to my birth when I should have been birthed with defects and all because the devil had the gall to try to take me out and take me down. But the Lord said no, so he picked me up and gave me a crown. He healed me that day. Oh, and by the way, he gave me gifts, talents, purpose, dreams. He made me so much more just to prove to y'all that he is Lord. And then I remember when I was a teen, falling into sin again and again, crying out for a win, sleeping with the same woman. But slowly and surely grace crept in, taught me how to say no to sin and yes to him and gave me the win. And then I remember all of the scriptures, the stories, everything in the Bible. It leads me to believe two things about who God is. Number one, he's not like you. He's true. He's not like I. He can't tell a lie. Number two, he will do what he said he would do. So what do you do when it doesn't add up and you're wanting to give up? You got to go back and remember who he is, what he does. He's faithful and he's truthful. Amen. I'm going to help you with something that helps me so very much. Have you ever had where you're really upset at somebody and, and it's gone on for more than a day, more than a week, more than a month, and you're just really upset and you keep playing these arguments in your head over and over again. What's kind of nice about playing arguments in your head is you always win. But what you're doing is you're creating some things in your mind to where it doesn't solve the situation. It actually compounds and makes the situation worse. It is very important what we are pondering on. And so a lot of times I hear this from different Christians. They'll say, wow, I used to be so zealous for the Lord. And I've lost a lot of my zeal. I've lost a lot of things. I just wish I was zealous like when I first came to the Lord. You ever had that happen in your life where you think, wow, I used to be more excited. I wish I was excited like that. But I'm going to tell you how to stir that up and get that back on the inside of you. And it's by remembrance because there's something about you calling something into your mind. Now, understand this. Your mind does not know the difference between when you are thinking it or when you're actually doing it. Your body doesn't know the difference. Like, for instance, Wyatt's keyboard. When he programs a song in there, that keyboard doesn't recognize whether Wyatt's playing it or whether he already played it. It's not recorded. It's not a recorded thing. It's actually playing it live right then all the different parts that he's put in there because it is it doesn't know the difference for instance in your mind if i were able to convince you right now that we were going to be attacked at in 10 minutes and i was able to convince you of that and you believed me your body is going to react as though it's going to happen your adrenaline's going to get going your heart rate's going to get going because your mind saw it and it became like a reality so this is what I do when I don't feel my zeal is up the way it should be. 
I start remembering the times that I was the most zealous. Oh, when I received the Holy Spirit and the first time I spoke in tongues, when I received Jesus into my life before then, when I was at this particular meeting and this happened, when God wrapped his arms around me, and I began to remember what it felt like. And I began to remember how just amazed I was. And when I began to do that, my mind experiences it again as though it's brand new. And so it's a real important thing that we keep our sights on the things of God. I'm going to give you a definition of remember. Remember means to recall to the mind. Something that is still present can be called up to the forefront of our mind. Recalling is a memory that's imprinted on our heart. God keeps us in his mind, in his memories of the covenants that he has made, even made the rainbow as a reminder. Our memories are located in the brain, in the temporal lobe, and we remember something. We actually relive the moment again that the memory was about. Even our senses are engaged, visual, smell, hearing. The event becomes present tense to us. So on the negative side, if we're reliving how this person said this and they actually did this and they we're reliving that, everything in your body begins to react as though it's happening right then. I, one time, and we were at a church when I was a teenager, and, you know, it's interesting because so many people that are at our church now knew me and I knew them when we were teenagers. But one of the things that we did one time is the uh, preacher said, I want everyone to go to somebody that's offended you. Well, this poor girl, because there was a line that went out the door and around the building for people standing in line because she had offended them. But I re one girl came to me and she said, I am so offended with you. And I said, could you tell me what I've done to you? And she said, I don't believe you have ever even thought about me one time. And I looked at her and said, you're right. I've never even thought about you. I'm sorry, what is your name? And this person was offended with me because she wanted to have some sort of relationship with me. She never pursued it, never told me about it. But she was offended about it. And she pondered it all the time. And it began to get her angry. And every time she'd see me talking to Jane, see me talking to somebody else, it would infuriate her as though I owed her something. Why? Because she was playing the wrong tape in her brain. And she is playing it over and over again. There is a thing in the realm of the spirit where you will actually remember something and it creates the same spiritual atmosphere that you had when that first happened to you. I can move right into the covering of God. And when I was so caught up and I couldn't do anything but see him, I can get caught right back up by causing my mind to recall it and having it be come fresh and new again. So this is going to be an important thing as we go through the teaching today. You know, the Bible says we have the mind of Christ, but our brain is something that we must submit to that mind of Christ. We must submit, and I'll ask God, rewrite that memory. Come on, let's do this memory again. I don't want that to be a memory. And I want to think about that which is good and lovely and a good report, because what it does in the spirit realm, when you think the things of God, when you're thinking about him, when you're thinking about the, uh, one of the definitions of righteousness is the heavenly possibilities. When you're thinking about the heavenly possibilities, what could happen in your situation, it actually opens up in the realm of the spirit for that to happen in your life. It is a very powerful thing. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. And the word substance there, when you study it out, it really means how much you can imagine what God can do. And so faith is as much as I can imagine what he do. So you can see that worry is the exact opposite. In Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 7, and people use this scripture in two ways, and I'm going to use it in two ways tonight. It says the memory of the uncompromisingly righteous is a blessing, but the name of the wicked shall rot. Now, people will use this, you know, boy, I'm getting older and I can't even remember why I walked in the kitchen. I can't remember where my keys are. I find them in the refrigerator. I'm going to start claiming the scripture. The memory of the righteous is blessed. I remember. I remember. And that's good. It works. It's truth. But this is talking about when you leave this earth, you're going to be remembered as a great blessing that was upon this earth and that you made your prince 
in this world, and you're going to, you're going to have a good name that continues on even after you've left this earth. And some, want, but claim it for your memory. I know, you know, you guys are kind of forgetful. No, 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 you're not. It says this in Psalm 112 and verse 6. He will not be moved forever. The uncompromisingly righteous, the upright and right standing with God shall be in everlasting remembrance. Now, this isn't talking about when you die, but it says right now, in the realm of the spirit, in the place of God, in our heart, in this earth where he is, he says he will always remember. He's always pondering. What is man that you are mindful of him? He's always thinking about you. In fact, how he created the world is he had us in his mind, and then he spoke that out and created the worlds. And so something we see with God is he's always got his thoughts upon you. And his thoughts are always, always for good. His thoughts are always thinking about the heavenly possibilities who you and I are. And so he did something after the earth was destroyed. He put a rainbow. And he did that so that all of us could be in agreement at the same time. See, when God says, bring my word before, you, before me, he's not there going, did I say that? Oh, my goodness. You're right. And we're not causing God to remember it. But what we're doing is we're being in agreement with what he has said at the same time he has said it. One of the biggest decisions in my life, hugest decisions in my life, is every day someone will say, where should we go to lunch today? And Wyatt will say, I said yesterday. And Shannon will say, no, I did. And Mary will say, no, I did. And we'll fight about where it's the hardest decision in the world to remember that. And so what I'm telling you with God is he wants us to be in agreement. When we finally agree on a place, then we all are going towards the same place. We all go to the same lunch place. We don't go to different places. We all show up the same. It's the same with God. When he talks about talking to him about his promises, it's so that you and I will be in agreement with what he has said. And so he put a rainbow. In Genesis chapter 9, I'll just give you the reference to it, Genesis 9, 14, from now on. When I form a cloud over the earth and a rainbow appears in that cloud, I'll remember my covenant between me and you and everything living that will never again with floodwaters destroy all life. When the rainbow appears in the cloud, I'll see it and remember the eternal covenant between God and everything living, every last living creature on the earth. And God said, and this is a sign of covenant that I have set between me and everything living on the earth. And so God even gave us a sign so we'd remember there's a covenant that we have with God. Jesus has a sign on his wrists and on his feet and on his side of a covenant that is everlasting that we have with him. God wants us to know he never, he's covenant keeping God. He never forgets his promises. He never forgets the covenant that he has with us. It's us that has to, oh yeah, hey, that can't happen. Hey, this is going to happen. And so we trust God, the covenant keeping God. I don't understand everything all the time. I know you all do, but I really don't. I don't get it all the time, but I do trust God. And I don't know why this happens or that happens, but I do trust God. And I don't know why we didn't grab this and why this came this way, but I trust God. And that's one of the most important things. And I remember, I do this when I'm in times of trouble. When I am, something is going on, I remember when I felt this way another time. I remember when I thought I'll never be able to take care of that. And God came through. And that's what David did when he remembered, well, I was able to kill the lion. I was able to kill the bear. He remembered the things that he had done in the past. When he remembered what he had done and how God had done it for him, he was able to go forward. And so tonight, I want you to be doing something. I want you, while I'm talking, I know you're intently listening, but while I'm talking, I want you to remember some of the greatest things God has ever done and how it made you feel. Something will happen as you do that. It will not only open the door, for it will happen again and again and again. It will cause your emotions to line up with the spirit realm. It will cause you to have the great zeal and the great feelings. You know, there's a, there's a, a great way to have a joy movement in a church. 
All you have to do is say, how many of you have ever been in joy movement? Most everyone has, has had some experience. And you'll say, hey, let's start talking about it. And before you know it, it comes in again. It's like uh, if you're ever sitting at a table and you're talking and, and you guys start laughing, the people at the other table will just start laughing for no reason. And you'll think, are they listening to us? But they just got something that was contagious. You yawn, everybody else yawns. So we're going to keep our minds and everything straight on the things of God. He says, and the Bible says that there will be a day where every knee will bow. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But I'll tell you something about remembering. In the Bible, this is so weird, they remember things that haven't happened yet. As though it had happened already because they're in the eternal realms. And you and I can remember, if we choose to, we can remember every knee bowing and every tongue confessing, though it hasn't happened, because we are in the realm of eternity. Over here, it says in Psalm 22, verse 27, At the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall bow down and worship before you. For the kingship and the kingdom are the Lord's. And he is the ruler over the nations. So the earth, the ends of the earth, remembers that all these families turn to God. Says it in another translation, in the message translation, Psalm 22, verse 27. From the four corners of the earth, people are coming to their senses, are running back to God. Long lost families are falling on their face before him. And God has taken charge from now on. He has the last word. The psalmist is remembering this. It hasn't happened in the natural realm, but God remembers it as though it already was. And we can remember this. So when you approach somebody, you approach them as though they've come to their senses and they're ready for God. Instead of trying to persuade them, you approach them as though they're already persuaded. And begin to talk to them about the call of God that is on their life. Remember, because it is, was, and always will be. Psalm 22 in the Passion Bible, verse 27. It says, from the four corners of the earth, the peoples of the world will remember and return to the Lord. Every nation will come and worship him. For the Lord is king of all who takes charge of all the nations. So I want us to do a remembrance right now. I want us to remember every knee bowing. I want us to remember, put this in the forefront of your mind, everybody confessing Jesus and falling on their face. Because in the realm of eternity, it's already happened. And God says, I want you to remember this. So you open up the realm for it to come. God remembers his covenant. When the psalmist cries out in this next scripture, he's saying, listen, I want you to remember that you're a God of loving kindness. How many believe God remembers he's a God of loving kindness? Yeah. But by bringing it before him that way, the psalmist is remembering. And he's saying, oh, and don't remember the bad things that I've done. So he says in Psalm 25, verse 6, remember, O Lord, your tender mercy and loving kindness. So they have been ever from old. Remember not the sins, the lapses, the frailties of my youth, of my transgressions. According to your mercy and steadfast love, remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. I like this because it talks about for his goodness sake. Have you ever heard somebody say, oh, for God's sake, do that. But God says, for my sake, I'm going to bless you. For goodness sake, I'm going to bless you. And he doesn't mean it in a slang way. He's saying, because of my goodness. For that sake, you're a blessed people that I do not remember the sins of the past. It says it this way in the Passion Bible, Psalm 25, verse 6. Forgive my failures as a young man and overlook the sins of my immaturity. Give me grace, Lord. Always look at me through your eyes of love, your forgiving eyes of mercy and compassion. When you think of me, see me as the one you love and care for. How good you are to me. I want to tell you something. God remembers this. When the psalmist brings up, then God and the psalmist are one. Where God is saying, remember, 
I remember you as the one I love and care for. We have this uh, friend of ours that uh, is a minister, and he says what he does because he travels all the time. He got a picture of his wife that he really liked. When they first met, he took this picture and he keeps it in his wallet. And he says, uh, just it, when they're fighting or anything, he'll leave the room for a moment and he'll look at that picture. And he'll remember that person that he loves and cares for, not the person that's on his back at that moment, not the person that's yelling at him, not the person he wishes he could just shut her up at the time. He remembers that one. He said he got to the point where he would be so angry that he'd leave the room, he'd look at the picture, and then he'd lick it, try to be, okay, I remember, yeah, I remember this person, I love him. And he said he had to get a new picture because he had licked it so much and he had to <laughs> laminate it. God has a picture of you and me. God remembers us, and he doesn't remember the things of sin because old things have passed away, and he beholds the fresh and the new. Psalm 74 and verse 2. Refresh your memory of us. You bought us a long time ago. Your most precious tribe. You paid a good price for us. Your very own Mount Zion. You actually lived here once. Now, I like this. I started thinking about God came to earth in Emmanuel, actually living here. You know, people are trying to buy uh, Smith Wigglesworth's old house and trying to buy these great ministers' old houses. Or um, I've been to where John G. Lake used to practice his sermons and where his church was. And there is a residual there, no doubt about it. But Jesus came and left far more than a residual. I am here and I can pull from the very anointing of Jesus that he left here on this earth. We're to remember what he did. We're telling him, refresh your memory. Really, what the word is saying is, oh, I've got to refresh it like you have it refreshed. And he says this in Isaiah 46, verse 9, still pleading out, earnestly remember the former things which I, this is God, remember the former things which I did of old. I am God, there's no one else. I am God and there's none like me. So what victories do you want to rehearse? One time Mary preached this, such a powerful message here at the church. She preached if these walls could talk. And we began to talk about all the incredible miracles that we have seen in this building. And when we start recalling the miracles that we're seeing, we're going to stop griping and saying, where are they now? I'm telling you, if we ponder on this, the goodness of God and the great and mighty things that he's doing, we will have more and more and more because we are lining our brain up with our mind of Christ. We are lining our soul man with the spirit of Christ Jesus. So I want you to get something in your mind where you had the greatest victory, the greatest presence of God. I've had times in the presence of God. One time Lupi was here. She was out in the presence of God. Nobody could lift her. And it was getting to be 2 or 3 in the morning. She was just gone in the spirit. I finally got a two-wheeler. She said, what are you going to do? And I said, with all my might, I'm going to roll you on this. I'm going to roll you out to your car. <laughs> Suddenly she got up and she was fine. I don't know. It just worked that way. But remember the times that you've had his presence on you so strong. You thought you couldn't breathe. All you could feel is God. And when you continue to ponder on this, that which was will be again. And it's, it's important that we rehearse the victories. Important that we rehearse what God has done, not only for other people, but for us, for your family. What has he done for you? And then God talks about the strong relationship that a mother has with her newborn. Now, just in case you haven't had a kid or your wife didn't breastfeed or whatever, I want to tell you this. When the baby cries the breast milk starts coming, and you can feel it. So it's not like, you know, you can ignore that. You know, maybe you can ignore the crime, but you can't ignore your own body. And so this is what God says, Isaiah 49, 15. The Lord answered, Can a woman forget her nursing child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yes, they may forget, yet I will not forget you. I have indelibly imprinted tattooed a picture of you on the palm of each of my hands, O Zion. Your walls are continually before me. Do you realize that God actually has an image of you 
on his hand. Now, if I'm going to try to remember something, I haven't done this in a long time. If I need to remember something, I'll write it on my hand because my hand passes in front of me all the time. Uh, God has us tattooed on the palm of his hand. So I went out for an acting part not too long ago. And the acting part, this was the description, female theologian jerk. And I looked and said, it's me. And uh, so I uh, put in for the part and I actually got the part. The millennial kids that were in this thing, they hated me because they thought I really was a theologian jerk just because I went for that part. <laughs> but here's what was weird. Is one girl said, I don't like you because you hate tattoos. And I said, I do? I had no idea. And she said, yeah. And my, she said, my boyfriend wants to marry me, but his father said no because I have tattoos. And he's a strong Christian, and he said, you cannot have tattoos. And I said, well, he's going to have trouble with one scripture in the Bible that says that we're tattooed on the palm of God's hands. She took out her paper, and she said, tell me where it is. And I said, no, I'm not going to do it because you're just going to try to win an argument. But I want you to know just love your father-in-law and different things like that. But what I'm saying is when people talk, and this was hilarious, there was an older woman, and she had her daughter call me. And her daughter said, you know who I am. I'm so-and-so's daughter. And she said, uh, I just want to know because I know there's a lot spoken in the Bible against tattoos. And so I want you to just tell me clearly. And I said, well, actually, your mom is wrong because we are tattooed on the palm of his head. Her mom picks up the phone and said, it's not me. I want to get a tattoo. She's telling me I can't. <laughs> so that was kind of good. Okay. So God says that we're tattooed there, but I want to see you, you to see what his tattoo is because I understand you can remove a tattoo if you hate it. They can do something, remove it after, you know, a time or something. So that wouldn't be permanent, but what God did is permanent. Let's look at this. Isaiah 49, verse 15 in the Passion Bible. Yahweh responds, but how could a loving mother forget her nursing child and not deeply love the one she bore? Even if, there is a mother who forgets her child. I could never, no, never forget you. Can't you see? I have carved your name in the palms of my hand. Your walls are always my concern. My name is carved on the hand of the father, never to be removed. Your name is carved. Our country, we're carved. Our people were carved on the palm of his hand, and he said, I'll never, no, never forget you. I have people that, after a while, they totally forget me. But I'll tell you something. God says, I will never forget you. I try to keep a characteristic in me that once we become friends, we're always friends. I'll never leave that friendship. I don't care what it is. I've made a commitment, and I'm in that friendship all the way for this life. God has that. He says, I'm a one that sticks closer than a brother. I'm a friend to you that way. God says, I will not forget you. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10. For God is not unrighteous to forget. Remember, that means to bring to the forefront of his mind, to forget or overlook your labor of love, which you have shown for his namesake in ministering to the needs of the saints, his own consecrated people, as you still do. It says it in the Passion Bible, Hebrews 6, 10. For God... The faithful one is not unfair. How can he forget the work you've done for him? He remembers the love you demonstrated as you continually serve his beloved ones for the glory of his name. God remembers. He remembers your love. Now, he remembers how I was supposed to do this and I didn't. He remembers how I really messed up here. and I No. He remembers. He remembers you. He remembers the things that you have done. You know, the Bible says... That when we stand before him, he's going to reveal the secrets of our heart and commend us. So maybe you didn't do everything right, but you wanted to, didn't you? And God says, when we come that day, he's going to reveal our secrets and he's going to reward us and commend us. This is my son. This is my daughter in whom I am well pleased. He says this in Proverbs chapter 3, that we're not to forget his word. Proverbs 3 verse 1. My son, forget not my law or teaching, but let your heart... Keep my commandments. Look what the reward is. For length of days and years of a life worth living and tranquility inward and outward and continual through old age till death, these shall be added to you. Shall they add to you? 
Let not mercy, kindness, shutting out of hatred and selfishness and truth, shutting out all deliberate hypocrisy or falsehood forsake you. Buy them about your neck, write them on the tablets of your heart, for you shall find favor and good understanding and high esteem in the sight for jud or, or judgment of God and man. I have favor with God. I have favor with man. How? Just real simply. I get length of days to where my life is fulfilled just by not forgetting what he said. And I'll tell you sometimes when we forget what he says, when real discouragement has come in and we think it's not happening. Things aren't working out for me. And we allow a discouragement to come in, and then we start thinking of all the other times we failed. Then if we can't find the times we failed, we start thinking about other people and how they failed. And we're doing the exact opposite. And God says, remember what I've said to you. Remember what I've said to you. In the midst of it looking like our ministry was over when we had first begun, God reminded us of what he had said. And you too shall be great upon the whole earth, says the Lord God. God promised us that we would go to the nations. Interesting thing, just as simple as this is, on the, the memorial service we did for my son-in-law last week, uh, or this week, the memorial service that we did, do you know that 55,000 people have watched it? We've never had hits like that, no matter what speaker we have. I mean, I think the most we've had before is 10,000, and that was some huge conference that we were doing. 55,000, and it's going up. It's amazing that this church can preach the gospel, 55,000 people. Pretty incredible. So don't look at your life and think, I'm just here, I'm just nothing. You have God. You have his fullness, and remember who he called you to be. Remember what he promised you. Remember the prophetic words that have been spoken over you. Remember what he told you. Remember what he said, because that's what will happen. He says the same thing over here in the, in the Passion Bible. Proverbs 3, verse 1, my child, if you truly want a long and satisfying life, never forget the things that I have taught you. Follow closely every truth that I've given you, and you will have a full rewarding life. Hold on to loyal love and don't let go. And be faithful to all that you've been taught. Let your life be shaped by integrity with truth written upon your hearts. That's how you'll find favor and understanding with both God and men. And you'll gain the reputation of a living life well. Oh. So my keys are seek first the kingdom of God. Everything else is added to me. My keys are go after God. Make it my great quest. My keys are to be with him, and everything else in my life becomes favor and blessing. That's what God promises. He promises that. He says this when the thief was on the cross with him. The thief said this in Luke chapter 23, verse 42. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingly glory. But Jesus wasn't waiting to go then and go, yeah, who was that guy on the cross next to me? He remembered him. He brought that to the forefront of his mind right then. And he said, and I tell you today, you'll be with me in paradise. They hadn't died. Nothing had happened to him yet. But Jesus lived in a remembrance of the future. Think about it. In John chapter 17, verse 4, Father, I am no longer in the world, but I pray that those who are. For, and then verse 7, Father... I am on this earth, and I am praying for them. Then a few verses later, Father, I am with you. He was always. He lived in remembrance of the future. You and I have the same gifting to live in the remembrance of the future. So here's what Paul did. He talked to Timothy, and he starts stirring him up by remembrance. Look at this. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Verse 3, I thank God whom I worship with a pure conscience. This is Paul. In the spirit of my fathers, when without ceasing, I remember you night and day in my prayers. And when, as I recall your tears, I yearn to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am calling up memories 
of your sincere, unqualified faith, the leaning of your entire personality on God in Christ and absolute trust and confidence in his power, wisdom, and goodness, a faith that first lived permanently in the heart of your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice, and now I am fully persuaded dwells in you also. That's why I would remind you to stir up, rekindle the embers, fan the flame, and keep burning the gracious gift of God, the inner fire that is in you by means of the laying on of my hands with those elders at your ordination. So here, Timothy's going through a time, having a tough time with things. And so instead of saying, I'll be praying for you, Paul does something very proactive. He says, I want to remind you of something. I want to remind you of the faith your grandmother had, and it's in you. I want to remind you of what your mother did, and it's in you. I don't know if you ever heard this about uh, Paul Cain, but his mother and his grandmother were prophets. And they prophesied to a town. And they told everyone in the town, there's a huge flood that's going to come and it's going to wipe out the entire town. Everybody needs to be out by tomorrow and all lives will be saved. If you do not listen to the word, every life will be lost. Well, they all got out of the town because they knew his grandmother and his mother. They all got out of the town. Their whole town flooded. All their lives would have been lost, but all their lives were saved because they listened to a word. Now, Paul. He comes along, and God had already told his mother he will be just like it was with uh, it, it, just like it was before, where you saw Elijah in John. The prophecy over Paul Cain is you will see the Apostle Paul again. I walked very carefully around Paul Cain because I knew the prophetic words about Paul the Apostle, and when he was down, he would remind himself of the stories of his mother and his grandmother because that same DNA is in him. You might have to remind yourself of some stories you've heard on Sid Roth. It doesn't matter. Just keep reminding yourself of the heavenly possibilities. And so when he reminded him, he said, now, I've reminded you of your grandmother, and it's as though they went right to that place again, right to the place where the elders were then laying hands on Timothy. And he said, now, stir up the gift that is in you. Go to the place where you had the most spiritual experience of your life. Go there in your mind, and in the spirit, you actually go there, and you can receive a stirring up and a reliving of the things that God wants you to remember and to live in. When Jesus, during his time, he told the disciples something, but I want you to look very carefully at these scriptures because it's going to say something interesting that you would just normally breeze by. In John 16 and verse 4, Jesus said, but I have told you these things now so that when they occur, you remember that I told you of them. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. How was Jesus talking to him right then? Doesn't it seem as though he was in the same room with them, within the same vicinity? And he said, I didn't tell you before. I didn't tell you before this time because I was with you. Well, you're with me now. I mean, what are we talking about? Jesus had already moved forward, but he was telling the disciples what was going to happen and what they could anticipate so they wouldn't be afraid when it happened. So let me give it to you in another translation here. John 16, verse 4. I'm telling you this now so that when their time comes, you will remember that I foretold it. I didn't tell you this in the beginning because I was still with you. Uh, okay, because he was able to come in and out of the realm of eternity. And you and I have the ability to do the same thing. And so Jesus warned them what was going to happen so they wouldn't be afraid. And he didn't tell them right at the beginning because he was still with them. And apparently in John 16, he wasn't with them anymore. Okay, so in Luke chapter 24 and verse 6, when Jesus uh, had died, and this was the report, he's not here, but he's risen. Remember how he told you when he, when, well, he was still in Galilee. He told them this was going to happen. It wasn't with them. He was somewhere else. He was speaking the future as though it was a memory. The Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. It's a memory 
of the future. So the disciples had to remember what he said. And I'm going to tell you something. Just remember when you think your life just is horrible now. Just for a moment, remember how awful your life was before Jesus. Because in Hebrews, it says that there was a group that looked back with homesick remembrance to where they had come from and they could find a constant opportunity to return to it. Instead of the Israelites looking back and saying, we were beaten, we were slaves, everything was stolen from us, this was their memory. Remember the leeks and the garlic? Remember how great the food was? Oh, I wish I was there. They had a selective memory. But if they had remembered reality for one moment, they never would have wanted to go back to Egypt. And so Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11, Therefore remember that at one time you were Gentile heathens in the flesh, called uncircumcised by those who called themselves circumcised, itself a mere mark on the flesh made by human hands. But remember that you were at one time separated, living apart from Christ, excluded from all part of him, utterly estranged and outlawed from the rights of Israel as a nation and strangers with no share in the sacred compacts of the messianic promise, with no knowledge of or right in God's agreement or his covenants. You had no hope, no promise. We're in the world without God. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once so far away through and by the blood of Christ have been brought near. I remember. And then I remember what he's done. And I bring that to the forefront. God wants us to remember prophetic words that you have gotten either straight from God, from someone else that you knew was absolutely accurate. God wants us to remember the prophecies from the Bible. So Jude, verse 17. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions which were made by the apostles, the special messengers of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. They told you beforehand that in the last days, in the end times, there would be scoffers, nah, we don't see that, who seek to glorify their own unholy desires, following after their own ungodly passion. It is these who are agitators setting up distinctions and causing divisions, mere sensual creatures, carnal, worldly-minded people, devoid of the Holy Spirit and destitute of any higher spiritual life. But you, beloved, build yourselves up Founded on your most holy faith, make progress, rising like an edifice, higher and higher, praying in the Holy Spirit. So, we got some instructions. We know that in the last days, there'll be wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes. But there's some specific instructions here, as well as there. It says, when we begin to see this, we're to look up, for our redemption draws nigh. Now, this said, when we see this, we're to start praying in the Spirit and building ourselves up. When we first got filled with the Holy Spirit, oh, we prayed for so long, and now we're a little here, a little there. Oh, I was vacuuming. But connect in with God again, and let him speak the words through you, and pray in the Spirit. Let me give it to you in the Passion Bible, Jude one seventeen. But you, my delightfully loved friends, remember the prophecies of the apostles of our Lord Jesus, the Anointed One, they taught you. In the last days, there will always be mockers motivated by their own ungodly desires. These people will cause divisions. They are followers of their own natural instincts devoid of the life of the Spirit. But you, my delightfully loved friends, constantly and progressively build yourselves up on the foundation of your most holy faith by praying every moment in the Spirit. So we have an answer for end times. I'm to pray in the spirit and I'm to remember that I am doing this and it is my safeguard over all the mockery, over all the things that are going on in this world. We're to remember the mercy of God. It's not that we have to go before God. You're supposed to be merciful. He is merciful. But when we go before God with his word, we are going before God to be in agreement with what he has said. Lamentations 3.21 it says, you thought there was no good scriptures in Lamentations? You're wrong. But there is one other thing 
I remember. And remembering, I keep a grip on hope. God's loyal love couldn't have run out. His merciful love couldn't have dried up. They're created new every morning. How great is your faithfulness. Now, we all say that God created the world in, uh, in the seven days or the six days and then rested. He's still creating. He's creating through you. He's creating because he says, my mercies are created new every morning. And so I got real bummed out because I did some things at night and thought, well, I have to wait till the morning. No, he's the bright and morning star. It's always morning in heaven. It's always that way with him and his mercies are new for you. But the psalmist or the guy in Lamentations, he said, I remember and remembering, I keep a grip on hope. So if you've lost hope, start remembering God's mercies and how faithful he is. Psalm 97, 12, rejoice in the Lord. You consistently righteous, upright, and right standing with God and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. The Passion Bible, Psalm 97, 12, and be glad and continually give him thanks for God's holiness is seen in everything he does. He's right in everything. He's pure in everything. And I'm to remember that because sometimes things happen and you think, why did you do that to me? Why? And then we get real good doctorly and we realize God didn't do it. But it's, why did you allow that? But we've got to remember, he's a God, a God of grace and mercy and loving kindness. And he will work all things together for good. It's a plea that we do here in Isaiah 43, verse 26. God says, put me in remembrance. Remind me of your merits. Let us plead and argue together. Set forth your case so that you will be justified and proved right. Now, I've always thought that seems so arrogant. I'm going to come before you. Well, you know what I did for you. It's, it's not that at all. When Hezekiah was told he was to get his affairs in order, that he was going to die, he turned his face to the wall, began to cry, and said, after all, I've done for you. And he started saying his merits. And God said, okay, you want to stick around some more? I'll give you some more time. And he did that. He brought his merits before him. Some of us don't have any merits, so we go on the merits of Jesus. That works out good. Isaiah 62 and verse 6. God, he says, God says, I have set watchmen upon your walls, O Jerusalem, who will never hold their peace night and day. You who are servants and by your prayers, put the Lord in remembrance of his promises and keep not silent. And so, Father, we put you in remembrance by putting ourselves in remembrance, that you are good and kind, that your mercy endures forever, that you're faithful, and every word you say is truth. And we are yours, and we put ourselves and you in remembrance of the great things that you've done. And just for a moment, think of the greatest thing that he's ever done for you. I've got too many to think of in a moment, but that was good. Okay, Malachi 3.16. Love this scripture. Then those who feared the Lord or worshiped the Lord talked often one to another. How many of you in this room have talked to people around you or your family, friends about the Lord? Just, it, it, it's a great conversation. Like when we get together, it's a great conversation to talk about, guess what God is doing in Tucumcari? Guess what God is doing in Albuquerque? Guess what God is doing? Great conversation. So now let's look at this. Those who feared the Lord and talked often to one another. The Lord listened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him of those who revered and worshipfully feared the Lord, who thought on his name. So just for a moment right here, I want you to think upon him. Think upon his sacrifice. Think upon his name. Do you realize when you did that, the scribes in heaven have to keep writing? There's a record that was kept from tonight. Verse 17. And they shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in that day when I publicly recognize and openly declare them to be my jewels, my special possessions, my peculiar treasure, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. God says, I'm writing about you. I'm writing about you talking and thinking about me. It's written. And you're carved on my hands. And I'll never forget you. And I'm giving you 
the newly created mercies every day. And you're always on my mind. In communion, this is what Jesus talks about, Luke 22, 19. And he took the loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it, gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance. Remember, that means to bring to the forefront of your mind. And if you will take communion and remember Jesus giving it to the disciples, see Jesus, because he says, I'm not going to do this again till I eat that meal with you. See Jesus. I'm telling you to remember the future. See Jesus giving you that meal in the heavenly realm. There were people during the time of Moses who went and ate a meal with God. You're going to eat a meal with God. The Bible says so. So why not remember it now, that which is going to happen in the future? The next time you take communion by yourself, at church, whatever it is, call him to remembrance so we can experience now that which we will see then. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four. 24. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this and call me affectionately to remembrance. Bring him to the forefront. I see you loving us, Father. And I see Jesus giving us his body, just taking it from him, giving it to us so that he becomes everything in us. I see Jesus taking his blood and giving us a cup of blessing and saying, Drink my DNA let it run through every part of you. And I experience the oneness. John 14, verse 26. But when the Father sends the spirit of holiness, the one like me, who sets you free, he will teach you all things in my name, and he will inspire you to remember every word that I've told you. Supernatural realm of the spirit where the Holy Spirit will bring to your remembrance everything that God has told you. In my most discouraging times, he reminds me of the wonderful miracles he's done in my life. He reminds me of what he said I would do and what I've already seen accomplished. Remember him. Remember what he said. Remember his covenant and be in agreement with heaven. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you that heaven is our reality, that you are more real than this building. And Father, I thank you that we call you to the remembrance right now. We call to remembrance that we are seated in heavenly places. We call to remembrance that every word you have said is truth. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Lisa, I believe this is yours tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Let me ask you a question as she's coming up. Did you guys really remember a time, think of a time, and ponder it for a moment? Now I'm going to challenge you. Ponder it for a lot of moments. It'll change your life. It really will. Thank you, Jesus. So I don't really have a word specifically for one person tonight. But one thing that did happen, um, I love when Claudia ministers because um, the way she ministers activates my imagination. And so it was really weird because God spoke to me <laughs> like the character in Lion King. <laughs> you just can't make this stuff up. Um, and he, he said the line from the movie where he says, remember who you are. But in this one, he says, remember who and whose you are. And he says, you spend too much of your thoughts on things and situations of little value. You decide and decree through your words, actions, and deeds. Remember, you are my models of my love and, and my ways in the earth. You are not the same as you were, for I changed you completely, nothing missed. I am confident in my work that I have created in you. You just need to catch up to the way I am and the way I think. And I think that's really what was the memory for what she talked about tonight. Everyone in this room has a relationship with Christ. 
And so we're just reminding you tonight. The Holy Spirit's reminding you. Claudia's reminding you. I'm reminding you of who you are and who you belong to. And he's saying, come on, clean up your thoughts. Let them go where they're supposed to go. And if you're having a difficult time in doing that because you have too many distractions going on, find that peaceful place. Find that spot. Find that moment where it's just you and he, and you can connect again and unhitch yourself from those things that are distracting you because your strength and your life comes from him, not from the distractions that are going on. So he's just reminding you tonight that he loves you, he cares about you, he wants the absolute best for you, but he also sees you're thinking and putting your mind on the lower level things when you need to be up here. And you can do this. We all can do this. So I really appreciate the word tonight. It was very, very good. Um, the vi I can still see the pictures as I'm talking in my head. I would be here for a while if I described it all. But just know God has you in mind. He has you in mind. And he knows where you are and he knows what you're going through. And for those who are watching online, this also goes for you as well. He knows exactly where you are and what's going on in your life. And he wants to remind you that he has not forgotten any word or any promise that was given to you. So hang on to that because it's, your deliverance is coming. Your healing is coming. The things that you need in your life are coming. Don't let go. Don't give up. Give in to him and let him do the work in your life. At the end of one of the songs that we sang today, Wyatt played a couple of chords like ta -dum, ta -dum. it sounded to me like galloping. And so I saw this picture of a, an adult riding um, one of those little horses, the rides they used to have outside of stores, tiny, you know, a little tiny little horse, but going around in circles and never getting anywhere. When, and so the Lord said to me, there are those people who choose to ride that little fake horse when they could be riding a stallion like this. And then I um, have this uh, from Psalm 23. In the Hebrew of Psalm 23, goodness and mercy do not follow us all of our days, all the days of our lives. That translation is far too bloodless for the verb redaf. It means chase after or pursue. The goodness and mercy of God don't follow us around like a good little puppy dog. They gallop after us like a celestial stallion. They chase us down labyrinthine paths like the hound of heaven. They stay hot on our heels. The goodness and mercy of our shepherd redoff us all the way to heaven's gate and into the arms of our Father. So we kind of had a horse theme going on. But I believe the Lord is saying, you know, don't settle for something that isn't the truth of who I am and what I have and want for you. Announcements, David? So tomorrow morning, uh, many of us car meet in the back. Um, I'm going to go over my trip to Israel, the pictures and where we went. So and we get breakfast. So if you got a chance to come, please come. And then after our meeting at 930, a glow is going to run the videos for the men who spoke at the convention in Israel. Both are uh, Messianic Jews. And they had a really good message. So if you're available, from, it's going to start at 9.30 in the morning here. Um, it should be really, really good. And that's a potluck, so if you could bring something to share, that would be wonderful. Thank you.
Yeah, he's not right. moving back here. I can yeah. see him. Yeah. He's pretty comfortable. No, okay. Uh, as many of you know, uh, John Michael Richardson has gone on to be with Jesus. Uh, it was very sudden. Um, the funeral arrangements are going to be in Moriarty. Uh, they're going to have a dinner uh, Monday and then a viewing, and Tuesday morning is going to be his service there. If you don't know who he is, I have a picture of him, and then you go, of course, the nicest guy here. And so uh, we really want to be supportive, so if you possibly can make it Monday night and Tuesday morning to Moriarty or get with people that go so there, let's do a great service for him, a great sending off, okay? Is there any other announcements? Anything else? See, we're so used to announcing somebody's coming. Somebody's coming. His name's Jesus. I'm not exactly sure the day or the hour, but he's coming. Amen. God bless you. The elders that are in attendance will be here for your prayer time. Uh, Jenny, Mary's daughter, went through surgery this week. That's where she's gone, and the surgery went perfect. She had knee replacements, and she's doing great. So we've got some good reports, and God bless you. Giant steps are what you take when you're walking as a son. Giant steps are what you take when you're walking as a son. Giant steps are what you take when you're walking as a son. Giant steps are what you take when you're walking as a son. No weapon formed against me shall prosper 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 i say no weapon formed against me shall prosper no weapon formed against me shall prosper i will call on the name of the lord i will call on the name of the lord in the day of trouble i will lift my offering and i will against me shall prosper no weapon formed against me shall prosper 
I said no weapon formed against me shall prosper. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Stir it up. Keep on stirring it. against me shall prosper say no weapon formed against me shall prosper I will call on the name of the Lord I will call on the name of the Lord in the day of trouble I will lift my offering I will call on the name of the Lord. Giant stare, giant stare. Keep walking, walking, and talking like a son. Mm, keep on walking, and talking like a son. steps are what you do when you're walking as a son. Giant steps are what you take when you're walking as a son. Giant steps are what you take when you're walking as a son. Giant steps are what you take when you're walking as a son. Giant steps.